So meet me in the bathroom beyond being the, the title of the, that oral history book about indie rock in New York and the documentary. Is that just like a cocaine reference? Like, or is it like a sex thing? What is it? Meet I me always, in the bathroom for I always, what? <laughs> yeah. I always thought drugs. I always thought illicit drugs, but I think it's probably both. Right. Yeah. I mean, so knowing that as the stroke song, meet me in the bathroom, I think I always assumed it was like a sex thing. Cause it's like, me, but me they in the definitely bathroom. did That's, a lot of, yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. They did a lot of cocaine for sure. But anyway, so I've read the book. Yeah. Same. You've read it, right? Yeah. And then there's a documentary, which I haven't seen. I've but... seen it. Yeah. Showtime documentary. It's um pretty abbreviated. What'd you think of the book? Yeah. It was a super fun read. Oral histories are fun. Yeah. You know, it, it not only talked about like, you know, the strokes and LCD sound system and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But some like other, other indie rock musicians on around that orbit at the time, like Connor Oberst and Ryan Adams. Yeah, like and the Rapture. How Ryan Adams got Albert Hammond addicted to heroin. And, um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think, you know, and then I think Ezra Koenig is also interviewed. Um, but yeah, he was like the intern for the Walkman or something. Yeah. One of the best, one of the great, like, books about kind of the, the rock revival, kind of the, yeah, a snapshot of New York City, um, in the early aughts. Yeah. And then that, in the that recent interview Noah did with that podcast Ion Pack, he talks about how he's like, yeah, we were kind of like the barnacle on the rock of that scene. And speaking of that barnacle, Justin, today on the show we are stoked to be joined by Brian DeGraw. He's of course a founding member of the phenomenal band Gang Gang Dance, who were you know a central part of this experimental scene or barnacle. It- yeah, because there was a lot, you know, there was this whole undercurrent scene that was much more experimental, much more, I'd say, diverse sound wise and, and yeah. more adventurous going on alongside this Strokes Rock revival thing. Um, and yeah. no one's really told that story. So we're going to do our uh, our little uh, alternative to Meet Me in the Bathroom, call it Meet Me in the Warehouse. And yeah, that's right. And by the way, you're listening to Bonefish Podcast. It's a show about indie music, experimental, psychedelic, things of that nature. And also the band Animal Collective. We've been talking about them a whole bunch. My name is Christian. I'm Justin. We wanted to, you know, revisit what was going on on the ground level in terms of the experimental scene, which was... Pretty exciting and ended up being, I mean, pretty influential, you know? Totally, so. yeah. Super fun talking to Brian and also super fun listening to Gang Gang Dance sort of in prep for the interview we did with him and then just for this episode. I mean, yeah, they rule. I feel like it, they were one of those bands for me that like, I don't really remember any of my friends like introducing me to, but just like getting to college and then like, you know, file sharing being thing you would just they were just one of the bands that like wound up in my itunes i feel like and then later you know like yeah for sure associated with animal collective and that scene and but yeah man saint dimpha and dope album eye contact a few years later yeah god's money it's really good and then uh we talk about we talk with brian about his solo record which it sounds like he's not really super in love with but uh we love it we love it for him it's okay yeah <laughs> Before we get to our interview with our talk with Brian, should we do a little Animal Collective? What are they doing now? Update. Absolutely. What, what are our boys doing doing now? So Av Tear just announced he's releasing a uh, an EP. It's like a, a collaborative thing. Is it a cassette? He's also about to set off on tour with Woods. The collaborative like tape. It's like with tom- is it with Tomato Flower that Baltimore? Or it's, band? A, it's a split release or a with split split Super Flower. 
Sorry, sorry, super flower. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, I think that's not going to be digitally released. It's only going to be, I think, to tape. Yeah, he says, my EP side will not be available digitally for the time being. I wonder if Dave will be, um, this will be kind of a continuation of Sevens, or will he bust out some new new material? Um, yeah, interested to see. What else? Rumors that like there's a, a geologist album coming, uh, which would be awesome because he hasn't really released like kind of like a proper solo album, and he's like the only member to not do that. Yeah, that would be sick. I don't know if that's true. Could just be speculation. Um, I think Noah's. I mean, Noah's always working. Sounds like Sinister Grift is wrapping up his, uh, his next solo album. There was snippets of. Like mariachi versions of some reset songs that. Oh right, yeah. Eventually, I think will be released and. Pele grow. <laughs> yeah, danger, dude. That sounds super awesome. Yeah, that'll be fun, and hopefully, Josh is um, recording his album. Elsewhere in experimental music, Sufjan Stevens' musical based on his album Illinois. Is hitting Broadway. Yeah. Did you have you heard about this? You've seen yeah. this, heard about this? Yeah. Um, me and my friend were talking about it. Love Sufjan. Yeah. That's cool. I wonder if it'll be a good Is it the first like indie rock Broadway adaptation? Like of the <laughs> I think so. Modern era? Like what else has there been? Yeah, I mean, Illinois is a very theatrical album and I could totally totally hear and see how it would be translated. Yeah. If you were to adapt one Animal Collective album for the stage, <laughs> what would you choose? Painting with, maybe. Ooh. The gayest Animal Collective album. <laughs> <laughs> All love. I don't know. Good question. Yeah. Um I mean, my initial knee-jerk reaction is Odd Sack, which is like obviously already visual, so it's sort of cheating. But that's wow. I mean, that would be yeah, that's kind of cheating, but that'd be that'd yeah. be amazing. But could you just see Noah like rowing on the rowboat across the stage, like mm-hmm. singing screens mm-hmm. with like a fog machine sort of like layer? <laughs> yeah. Thinking a little bit more, I thought I thought maybe Spirit. Mm. I thought that could be a kind of. I thought that could be adapted into like an interesting, like coming of age, like loss of innocence, like. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. Maybe you incorporate some of Dave's like own personal story, like moving to New York, like, and sort of the. Yeah, I don't know. I thought that's, that could. It's be, a good one. It, it would, you know, like fifty people would go. <laughs> off 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 Broadway. No, that would be dope. That'd be cool. Um I feel like Sung Tongs would be good. I mean Hungry Bread and Butter Hustle. Mm-hmm. That's enough narrative baked in right there. world of experimental music you sent me this track uh, earlier today featuring floating points and laraji two goats themselves but uh the actual main artist on the track is shabaka i don't know how to say the name shabaka uh, yeah i think it, i think it's shabaka shabaka hutchings uh it's his full name but yeah the record's under shabaka multi-instrumentalist who I guess was part of the so when Floating Points did the Hollywood Bowl performance of their record Promises I guess yeah that was Shabaka him. was part of the ensemble, ensemble. yeah he, he was like Pharaoh Sanders like he was playing his parts right okay maybe yeah I think that was him checks out I'm like really psyched for this album because well the the, the single with Laraji and Floating Points is so good. Uh, it's called I'll Do Whatever You Want. Yeah, real nice. Floating Points, when he collaborates with like a, a jazz musician and does the ambient jazz thing where he works almost more like an editor, Yeah, you know, like on Promises, is mm-hmm. so, so good. And um, the two singles have been really good. And it, the album is called 
perceive its beauty, acknowledge its grace, and it comes out on April 12th on Impulse Records, which is home to John Coltrane and Alice Coltrane, other Shabaka projects. He, he was in Sons of Kemet, which is disbanded, but he played like sax, I think, in that group. Basically, this I feel like like this is the like this is going to be like better than the Andre Flute album. I feel like yeah, definitely was getting those vibes. Yeah, woodwind master. Yeah, exactly. Like on our hands. Yeah, I mean that first couple of minutes of that track so beautifully layered and yeah, it definitely seems like uh, the Andre record is like you know primed the earth for receiving stuff like this. Well, yeah, I feel like this is the beginning of just kind of more of the spiritual jazz stuff, more woodwind stuff. I guess Andre actually plays on this song. Oh, interesting. On on the single, and Shabaka played on New Blue Sun. Carlos Nino is on, is going to be, I think, on this album, on his, on Shabaka's album, which is, it is like his first solo album. He dropped an EP in 2022, which is, I've been listening to a lot lately. I, I dig it. Anyway, I feel like keep your ears out for this one. It's gonna be it's gonna be awesome. I guess this guy he stopped he like stopped playing saxophone and he picked up this Japanese flute and some like, like Mayan an drum. flute, right? Yeah. yeah, it's called a shakuhachi, and he also picked up this Mayan drone flute, some Brazilian stuff, some indigenous flutes. Um, so hell yeah, yeah, that track. With Laraji and Flowing Points. Love it. Yeah, I love Laraji's feature too. I mean, yeah. he's a legend at this point. I mean, he, uh, back in the late 70s, 80s, he did one of the ambient records with Brian Eno. It's like one mm. of the first four. It's not the first one, but, uh, yeah. He's got a bunch of music, is definitely, uh, a unique soul. He's mm-hmm. got some great laughter <laughs> featured in this track towards the end. Oh yeah, is that him? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, it's him. Nice. Cool. And yeah, without without further ado, let's get to our interview with Brian DeGraw of Gang Gang Dance. for uh thanks for taking the time to chat with us so much we could chat about i thought first i would just ask you if you've seen any uh if you've seen any streaming bumps for mind killer uh in the dune <laughs> now that we're in dune fever <laughs> oh man no i didn't even think about that actually i was <laughs> related to that um, is it i guess yeah I, don't, I didn't even know i sort of assumed yeah i'm not a dune guy so i don't really know like, me neither what what happened actually well so gay gang dance has a track mind killer yeah and yeah and that's like a dune is a there's that like fear is the mind killer yeah um, oh okay cool she's got that much spike spike <laughs> on the neck but oh, right. you guys got to get that on TikTok, man. Yeah. I was going to say, like, <laughs> the, the time is prime to... Uh, <laughs> True. Culture that's... is ready for doing reference. A good idea. Material. We could use the income. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tight. Well, yeah, we're we're big fans of of Gang Gang and uh, in your solo stuff, both your music art and your, and your visual art. What, what have you been up to? What have you been up to lately? Uh, I guess since the pandemic and whatnot. I mean, kind of the usual art and music, but um, sort of more painting for the past two or three years, basically. I still do everything else, but that sort of has taken over a bit just because of getting more shows and opportunities to do stuff. So I'm just kind of always on these deadlines now for that, which takes away a little bit from music and stuff but uh i still manage both you know yeah but mainly 
last few years has been a, a, a lot more about that than at least like live music and stuff, you know. Right on. Yeah, definitely dig dig your paintings. Um, did you feel more of like a visual artist and like a maybe like audio artist, or is it kind of comes in waves? And do I? Did you say or did I? Or do you? Yeah, do you? Um, yeah, I, mean, I definitely feel totally like divided, fifty fifty. But um, right on. I used to be able to kind of manage both at the same time, but something happened in the past few years where I sort of have to do one or the other. It doesn't really work out that well, you know. Um, I used to be better at like integrating them and bouncing back and forth, but now I just kind of have to like focus on one. And then when I need to switch over, I just fully switch the other side of my brain off kind of, you know, there's little things that kind of carry over, but Mm -hmm. for the most part, I have to kind of like choose one or the other nowadays and just focus and then wait until there's an opportunity to shift back to the other side, you know? Yeah. Do you find it's more, it's mainly like opportunity based these days? Like, yeah. Like what spurs on one over the other, I guess. Mm, Yeah. I mean, just, yeah. Deadlines and stuff. Yeah. Opportunities, I guess. And also I've been making music like mostly on my own for the past few years. I'm not like totally sure I enjoy it that much. (laughs) (laughs) Like I really like, I keep like making an effort. I'm always making music. I mean, pretty much every day, but uh, I haven't like found that place where I feel that good about like the physicality of making music alone, you know, it's, yeah, I like, I like thinking about it on my own and then like working on it on my own. But when it comes down to it, like I get a lot less excited to like present it, I guess, um, just on my own. I don't know. I like to bounce energy off other people and stuff. So yeah. Yeah. It's also why I've, I've sort of like shifted more into like film scoring and stuff because that sort of works well for me in terms of being in my own world you know oh cool yeah so not much musical collaboration in the last couple of years obviously it's been harder not, to not get a, together not a whole people. lot yeah not a whole lot like basically like when pandemic started from then on haven't done a whole lot with with other people like uh musically yeah un- un- understandable yeah understandable the painting zone um yeah. Doug, Doug, Doug what was your last solo work? Was that uh, your solo album from like 2013? Uh, was that Someone. your last kind of album? I think that, yeah, I'm terrible yeah. at the time, years and I stuff. Do, I, I dug that. I dug that, man. It was good. Yeah. Um, uh, that was a weird one for me. I, I'm the wrong guy to like talk to about, uh, like, <laughs> I, I'm fairly ashamed of that record, to be honest. Well, I was going to ask you because I remember. You told an interv- you told an interviewer that you like yeah you you kind of felt uncomfortable with that solo record and, and I wonder why because I I bumped that shit hard when it came out I, I like yeah. it you know <laughs> um, I always like to hear that but I still haven't gotten there myself with it um, at the time did you feel different about it when you released it, it it was really weird like I at the time I really like when I was making it I was living in Woodstock upstate and just in uh-huh. uh, pretty deep like solitude on top of this mountain and this beautiful house and um wow and we were taking a break from gang gang but i still wanted to like make something and kind of use the break as an opportunity to i don't know just do something else musically and um so i worked really really hard on the record and then basically the minute i finished it and handed it in i realized like I didn't feel connected to it at all. Like, <laughs> like yeah. and that was sort of part of the point. Part of the point of that record for me was to try to like escape myself and not have the, like an alter ego or anything like that, but just to kind of like, I didn't, I was tired of uh, like the distinctions of my role musically and in, in gang gang and stuff. And I just wanted to make like these weird, like pop experiments or something, you know, my version of that, I guess. And uh, that was cool. Like the process was really cool and interesting. But then the minute I, like literally the minute I turned it in and I was like, what What the fuck did I just do? Like, I don't even like this at all. Like, I don't, this feels so insincere. 
and weird. And then I, I instantly just wished like, yeah, I should have spent the past six months just doing something that I actually <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> something to get out of your system. Maybe yeah, well, that's, you know, that's... it's still confusing, but um, that was the point to like, to escape myself and be something because <laughs> it did really interesting. interesting. Yeah. I wonder yeah. if like, yeah, because stepping away from like the gang gang, yeah. uh, having it not under that name, having a, a separate thing, you know, makes sense, especially for something that's kind of on the face of it, like more of an experiment, yeah. but then having it be your solo thing also yeah. puts the added like sort of spotlight on, oh, this must be like his. Yeah, I think that, that, that was part of the problem that it was on like the our label and it was all promoted and everything like I would be more happier with that record if it just kind of existed secretly or something. And you know what I mean? Like that I can deal with as in like an experiment, but, to, but yeah, like you said, to have it be like my debut solo thing, or whatever. It was like, it was kind of a mess, but anyway, I've moved, I've moved beyond the trauma of all that. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you think there's another solo or, or more gang gang music in yeah, the future? Sure. I have some stuff coming out actually like this year. Um, oh, nice. Oh, sweet. Soundtrack release for some films that I did. Nice. I did. Can uh, you sh- um, share the names of those or the, or the, uh, I did release composition for uh, Chloe 70 short films that she directed. She did three short films. Oh, nice. And I did all the music for those. And um, this label in London called Deeper Into Movies. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It's more of like a film uh, organization. They do like film screenings and events and stuff. And uh, they re- they started releasing some soundtrack records. And uh, so it will be on that. It'll be a compilation of the three films, the music I did for all three films. And nice, I sort of nice. edited it into a seamless kind of just two sides of a record or whatever. Oh, cool. Will that, will that be under BDG or just Brian? That'll just be under my name. Yeah, my, my name. Brian DeGraw, yeah. Can you uh, give us a little taste or hints of the vibe, maybe? Or, uh, you... uh, I mean, it all pertains to the film, you know, so yeah. Um, in that sense, like, it, the films can control that a little bit, you know? But uh, sure. But I did make a point to, like, because, like, when, when I, most of the film stuff I worked on, like, the film dictates a little bit more than than I do, you know, the, the mood. So a lot of times it's like, you know, sometimes it's like background type stuff that may not be that interesting as standalone music or whatever. But with this uh, record, I made a point of kind of like digging through all those sessions for those films and using a lot of like outtakes that I thought were maybe a little more interesting than some of the music that was actually used. There's plenty of the music that was used, but I pulled from a, a lot of outtakes to make it more of like an interesting rec- record, you know. Nice. With like scoring stuff, do you? Uh, I know you're like a, key, a keyboardist is like your main instrument, right? Or yeah, like electronics and electronics. So uh, yeah, do you do you like start on piano or do you start with like electronic textures or like where do you? Um, where does it begin? It could be days. anywhere. Yeah, it could be anywhere really. Like I have a, a pretty like standard setup that's kind of like my I, I guess my gang gang setup that I always sort of rely on still for everything. That's always like the starting point. I don't usually explore much outside of that in terms of starting stuff. You know, I kind of, I'm just so familiar with that gear that, so it'll be like some older sequencers, like older Electribe sequencer and this Korg M3 synthesizer and um, some SP555, you know. Keep going, There's, keep going. We love you to talk. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's just like, yeah, my whole station for Gang Gang is like always where I start kind of with everything. And now I have, I've been playing piano, piano a lot too. I have a piano, I got a piano during the pandemic for the first time in my life. And that's been kind of 
a life changer. I don't necessarily like sit and write much on it, but uh, I don't know. I, I practice on it every day as like a sort of meditational exercise. We were, we were talking to jo- Josh from Animal Collective and he was saying the right. same thing. He's just been religious about the piano like every day. Yeah, yeah he got super into it in the past few years. So. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, we should definitely share our love of that exercise quite a lot. Nice. So we were thinking that we kind of, I don't know if you read the Meet Me in the Bathroom book or, or saw the documentary. I saw the film finally, but I didn't. I never read the book. And then I held off on the film for quite a while. But I watched it like, I don't know, four months ago, finally. Oh, right on. Yeah. And we thought it'd be fun to do kind of an alt version of that, focusing on the stuff that Gang Gang, Animal Collective, Black Dice, other bands, the community they kind of had going more so in Brooklyn. And yeah, um, yeah I just think that story it needs to be told more and it is also pretty interesting. And anyway, can you just like talk about, you know, how, how you got to the city and kind of your, your origin story into, into New York? And Yeah, well... I mean, I grew up not far from here. I grew up in Connecticut. So oh, me too. Oh, yeah? Whereabouts? Uh, right in the middle, uh, like 20 minutes south of Hartford, a town called Berlin, next to New Britain. Oh, nice. Cool. How about you? Uh, like in this town, Milford, it's kind of near yeah, New Haven. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, nice. Oh, I didn't know that. Cool. Yeah. So anyway, I was like, I grew up kind of coming to the city all the time. So this, I don't know, it's always in one way felt like home or whatever. But uh, in terms of like for several years, I tried to, I attempted to go to art school there and I I only lasted one year and then I decided to leave, but I stayed in DC and kind of just worked on painting a bit. And then I started making music there Mm -hmm. and I had a band called The Cranium, which was like a four piece kind of like really mathy, sort of like post-punk, no wavy type thing. And I did that for a few years and then put out some records. And then at some point, just kind of DC sort of exhausted itself in terms of what I wanted to do with art and stuff. So decided to move to New York. And that was around either 97 or 98. And um, so, yeah, I don't know. From there, I tried to continue doing that band, The Cranium, but just as a two piece with me and the vocalist. And it was more like a kind of like suicide ripoff type thing. Yeah. Like me on synths and him singing. And he was this really amazing, like charismatic front person. And cool. that was cool and everything, but it didn't last very long. I don't know. It was just weird. And uh, for whatever reason. And then let's see from there, like, uh, well, Tim, the drummer from Gang Gang, original drummer, was in the cranium with me in D.C. So when I moved to New York, he maybe move back to Michigan for a while, but he didn't move to New York with with us. And then eventually he ended up in New York and then we started like jamming together again. And we had this thing that we called death and dying. And that was like a four piece. And it was sort of like something in between like cranium and gang gang. It was like this Mm. transitional thing that was sort of more closer to cranium in the terms of like instrumentation. Uh It was bass, drums, guitar, vocalist, and more like post-punk kind of no wavy thing. And were you guys in Manhattan or were you already in Brooklyn at this point or where were you? Uh, in initially, yeah, m- pretty much Lower East Side, the same place that I am now. Not the same apartment, but the same neighborhood I've always been in since then, you know. There was little stints in Brooklyn just for financial reasons, I guess, like sometimes moving around a bit. But, um, but yeah, we were always like Manhattan people and a Manhattan band, which is... Yeah. Often like uh misdescribes like we always just were always called a Brooklyn band and none one of us lived in Brooklyn, you know. <laughs> yeah, are you and are you talking about the the band at the time that you formed when you were there? Are you talking about Gang Gang? Uh Gang Gang was like yeah, a yeah. Man, like Manhattan. You 
Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Always, you know, when this whole Brooklyn explosion thing happened, we always got lumped into that. Mm. We made a point of being like, oh, we're from Manhattan. Just, you know, not to be like all territorial, but I thought it, there's like a, a pretty amazing lineage of like Manhattan bands, you know, and we were happy to be part of that or whatever. Uh, I wonder why that is. Is that because your music was maybe so different from like the typical kind of Manhattan bands like the Strokes or LCD Sound System maybe and that you got? You yeah, got them, I got you it. had to be like geographically somewhere else, like a Brooklyn band or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think enough leather. To writers just they didn't know the difference. You know, they didn't even bother to like. Right. Yeah. A Brooklyn thing happened, and then all of a sudden, like all of New York was just Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah. Laziness or whatever, but yeah. yeah. But um. Anyway, like, yeah. Go ahead. Oh yeah. So then um. We had this that death and dying project, and we didn't do that much. We never made a record or anything, but we played a bunch of shows. And uh, at some point, like around there, then there was a gallery that we all sort of hung out at, and Liz from Gang Gang worked there. And uh, that was like, yeah, Dave uh, Portner worked there too. And that was kind of actually how we met Dave and. I don't know. It was like our little circle of friends all were connected to this gallery that it no longer exists. But um, it was run by this amazing guy called Colin Deland, the gallerist, who was this really eccentric kind of amazing. They would always call him like the Keith Richards of the art world. Like he was sort of a wild child within that within that world, you know. So through that gallery, American Fine Arts, uh, at some point, Colin, his wife, Pat Hearn passed away and she was also a gallerist. And when she passed away, he asked us to cover one of her songs from, she used to be in kind of like some no wave project in the eighties, like with guys from the lounge lizards and stuff. So from that era. And he asked us if we would like cover one of her songs at a Halloween party. And when we did that, we uh, did that with me, Tim, and Liz as a trio. So that was basically three of that. That was basically the start of Gang Gang. You know, we stopped doing the other thing. Liz kind of re- came in as vocalist uh, with me and Tim, and then we added Josh, who we were already friends with. And then from from basically from that Halloween party on is when when Gang Gang started. And, and that was, in terms of a thought. time period, this was around what year you would say? Uh, early, I believe early. I believe it was two thousand. Cool. Halloween of uh, 2000. Yeah. Nice. Well, how did you meet Liz? Through the gallery, uh, right? No, uh, we, we sort of were introduced to the gallery th- because we had met Liz already. But um, uh, we met uh, when Cranium, we came up to New York once to play a show at this really funny like pizza place in, in Williamsburg called the Charleston, which is still there, actually. And they used to do these weird shows. It's like this really dark wooden old old pizza place bar kind of place and they would do like uh some pretty weird out there shows you know i mean williamsburg was like desolate at that point too there was nothing there yeah i was wondering could you uh paint us a picture <laughs> of uh yeah, I mean, brooklyn uh around this time uh it was, it's... it was literally like desolate it was i mean i lived there for a minute around this time and there was nothing like the streets were even dark. There wasn't even like like street lighting. It was really weird. Like, and the, where, there where was did like, you like, live? Like, in a, like, where did you live in? Uh, in the gi- giant loft, uh, or like not loft, but cold, freezing cold warehouse space that we shared. Me and a bunch of friends. I think there was like eight people living in there. Art life, and it was like some five thousand square foot, like just freezing cold, like garage. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it was amazing and if you go there now it's some like 40 story condo for yeah. 7000 dollars a month you know yeah but i think we desolate in a different think, way <laughs> yeah yeah exactly even more, more desolate corporate I, desolate I yeah <laughs> but uh if i remember right i think like we paid i don't know i think the entire place was like $1000 or something yeah. split between eight I think our rent was like $150 or whatever. Yeah, it was crazy. Oh, but anyway, there's nothing there. There was a, you know, I don't know how familiar you guys are with New York or Brooklyn Pretty, or whatever. Yeah, that. relatively familiar, yeah. Well, Williamsburg is like, you know, just totally overpopulated now. And oh, it's yeah. just one of these. Yeah. yeah. 
But uh, there's like a main strip in Williamsburg called Bedford Avenue. And I remember like the Charleston, this place that we played is was on Bedford. And at the time, it was basically just that place. There was a pizza place across the street, which is still there also. There was a Polish bar that served like pints of draft beer out of giant styrofoam. Nice. Was it cups. We used to call it styro bar. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and there was like a pierogi place or something. And, it, and there was oh, yeah. literally nothing else there. It was really crazy. Um, yeah. So... That was the vibe when we were when when we played there, and then so anyway, when we played there, we came up from d c to play, and the other band that was playing was Liz's band, and they were called actress, not the not the dude, the u k guy obviously not the dude. and not the ex New York dolls, which were also called actress <laughs> but um, so we met there, and her band was really cool. It was also this really like weird no wave kind of performance art type project and from then we just were instant close friends you know meeting her and her group of friends definitely contributed highly to us eventually deciding to move this this little pizza place was the seed of it all was kind of the the experimental scene that's still there it sounds like (laughs) (laughs) the guy used to was run by this really old couple and when you played like they didn't have any lights or anything and the guy would just like stand by the light switch and just switch it on and off like <laughs> 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 it was amazing That's awesome. did um so while you know this whole stroke scene was going on you know yeah 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 did you guys feel connected to it were you like on this shit or were because you guys no. were kind of you, yeah you guys were <laughs> on your own like making your own subversive art um which is very different yeah. so you guys were like not on that shit we were friends with all those people and oh, uh, interesting. close to them as 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 friends but musically there was a real divide there actually like i don't think any of us were going to see it uh like maybe with the exception of the iis for me because they were the like uh, and still are close friends of mine or whatever, but um, and I enjoyed seeing them always, but I never, I never once saw the Strokes. I never saw any of those bands, like still to this day. But um, yeah, <laughs> uh, but we're checking them out. Check them out. Yeah, <laughs> heard they're heard they're pretty good. I heard they're pretty they're good. Not symbols. That's what I heard. <laughs> they they used to not use symbols. Oh, I don't wow. know. That's what I always remember. Like their record has no symbols. <laughs> oh. That's what the heads were talking about on the ground floor back then. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. Uh, I don't know if that's such true. an early aughts weird like music detail. Love yeah, it. like but um, weird flex. That's cool. But, I mean, yeah. Did, did it make like, you guys feel more competitive or anything like that? You like, did it make you? Did it make you more creative? Like hearing this other scene was kind of growing at all, or were you just like on your own thing? It just didn't like register at all. Really, like it was cool. Like. <laughs> you know, there was like a buzz around and that was cool just because like we were friends. So we were happy for a lot of those people and yeah. it was exciting. In that sense. But physically, I just don't remember being all that like involved or attracted. Yeah. To I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. It does sort of, of it, make know. sense. It's like maybe a, a band that has a foot and maybe sort of both those camps a little bit. Especially, I'm more thinking, yeah, they were yeah their cool. first record they were like, and... They were loose and like raw and, you know, I, I related to that. They were kind of like you know, they they just kind of came out of nowhere, like organically. And a lot of these other bands, they seemed so like calculated and kind of like, you know. When you decided to move, like after that pizza show, when you decided to move to New York, mm. how aware were you of like that scene slash like the scene you would become part of? Was there like an attraction? I know you said like, oh, things that kind of run their course in D.C. Mm. Was like playing with Liz's band, was there a sense of like, oh, this is kind of where stuff I'm into yeah. is maybe happening or I guess, yeah. What, what was your, like, your aim and moving there? And yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I guess like we were um, pretty, pretty like into just that history, you know, like the no wave scene and pretty attracted to that in general. And it just historically, like what, what was happening in New York um, in the eighties and I don't know, but seventies and eighties, I guess, or whatever. And like um, Ardo Lindsay. Yeah, all that stuff. stuff. Yeah, DNA and Mars and those kinds of bands. And it just nice. seemed more exploratory. And D- DC was like amazing uh, in its own right, but it was much more like kind of confined to like this 
very standard like rock and roll thing you know like or whatever like punk emo punk, thing more so, yeah more so punk which, was, which was cool i loved a lot of that stuff too and i met all those guys doing that and that, that was an amazing time in my life too but uh when i was living there i think myself and a lot of the people that i was living with in dc also got exposed to a lot of like free jazz and started kind of venturing more into improvisation and those worlds through uh through like free jazz and also like a lot of ethiopian music because there's a oh right on there's a large uh ethiopian population in dc so we were like hanging out at like ethiopian restaurants and bars and like hearing that music and getting really inspired by that and and then like get leaning more into like free jazz territory and getting further and further away from like the dc like hardcore thing or whatever and uh I don't know, you know, that was sort of naturally led us to to wanting to go somewhere where there was more out there stuff happening. You know? Can you think of a moment, whether you were making music with like Gang Gang or as a, somebody in the audience seeing some of your friends making music that really struck you and was really inspiring where you were like, oh, hell yeah. Yeah, I mean, all the like the early Black Dice shows were like some of the most mind expanding to this day like one of the like musical moments i've ever experienced you know and of course like the animal collective shows you know but black dice i think we were kind of exposed to first maybe yeah um, what was it like seeing them back then it was <laughs> so i think because they were like coming out still coming out of like you know they used to be like a kind of like a hardcore band i don't know how familiar you guys are with them but they came out of providence right yeah but they were yeah they did like this RISD scene or whatever yeah yeah but uh their, their earliest records like seven inches are kind of like more like i don't know they're hardcore records they're not they're that experimental they're kind of like just gnarly like uh grind grindy like hardcore records and they're cool but around when we're when we were seeing them at this time they were sort of like coming out of that and starting to deconstruct that and those were like, that was a really special era, at least to me, for them, because they still had elements of this really, he this super heavy, like, aggressive thing. But it was like, they were just like, ripping it apart and like, just doing like, very wildly experimental things, at least in terms of what I had seen before, you know, like, I remember like some of the earlier shows that I saw of them, like Aaron, who was mostly playing bass at the time when they were still kind of like hardcore ish. He had like a champagne bucket with a contact mic on it. It was just like going crazy on that thing. And then Bjorn was like playing his guitar, but then just like unplugging it and just playing the cables like, like this, you know, just, <laughs> no, and I, like, and all through like delays and whatever. And to me, that was like, uh, just so made, like really just like mine blowing to to see and they were so fucking loud at that time too they, they were notoriously loud band you know so all of that's happening at this like extreme volume and just the energy was uh, uh, just incredible you know Those are still some of the mo my most memorable shows, you know. Do you remember the first time you saw the Animal Collective guys make music? I don't really remember the first time, but I the early, I, early time maybe. Yeah, tons of shows around that time I remember, but I, I can't recall like the first, the very first time I saw them. But um, but yeah, they were equally mind blowing. But they were on a sort of a different tip, you know. I guess like one show that I think about a lot is one of the shows that's on the holland holland again record the live that live record yeah um i remember that show there's I, I guess that record consists of a couple live shows i don't remember exactly but i know that one of the shows that is on that record was the show at the a radio station called Three One Zero Three, where we used to play sometime we might i don't it's possible we even played the same show i don't remember exactly but um but around that era, those those shows were 
so mind blowing to me too. Like uh, it was basically like Noah just on kit. He still wore like a little panda hat and stuff, <laughs> and he was going crazy, like pretty like loose improv, like free jazz style drumming or something. And uh, you know, Dave was they they wore like masks. And Dave had some weird mask and was singing through like some cardboard tube with a uh, <laughs> like some contact <laughs> effects or something. And you know, I, coming from DC, we we weren't like experimenting in those kinds of ways. So all that stuff was so so beautiful to see you know and uh at that it heavily influenced gang gang in terms of exploring effects and using uh electronics and stuff like that yeah that definitely seems to be kind of when i think of like this like your guys particular like sub scene within the larger new york thing that does seem to be like one of the keys that sets it apart is like the exploration and like the tendency towards like improvisation yeah. whereas the other stuff presented itself as like a much more kind of buttoned up thing but yeah. uh but that i i see is sort of like the the through line to to your scene is like um and, and even in your music in your records it you know an openness you it openness yeah. and you get across that feeling of like like jamming maybe with little guidelines or loose guidelines and then kind of those moments of like discovery or like epiphanies that kind of happen within yeah. that. And then trying to translate those moments that happen wherever, you know, in the practice space, in the warehouse, like to a record. Yeah. Um, that seems to be yeah a, a, sh a shared value. It's so funny. Like Justin and I both became animal collective fans during like the Meriwether era. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. And, um, and so the first time we saw them, or first time I saw them, Black Dice opened. Oh, and wow. I was like, what the fuck is it? Like, it was like, you know, so I was like, I'm here for like, another sport, yeah. like summertime yes. clothes. And then there was like just an hour of like nonstop. Yeah. But they were like, wait a second, this is, this is who Animal Collective learned from. So I should maybe try yeah. this out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then that, really. then, that got us, sense. then that got us to your guys' music. Yeah. Um, and love we all, we all used to share a practice space uh, us, oh yeah nice collective and black dice um shared this really tiny space in williamsburg also and that was yeah that was mind expanding too just to be around those guys during that time i remember like one memory that always sticks out to me is like we would show up to practice and like ac guys would still be in there so we'd just sit in the hallway and listen and you know it happened all the time so they weren't very good practice space roommates. They were no, they're going great. over there. They were <laughs> Everyone's they were they were totally it was a treat when they went over because we would just sit there and listen. But um but I remember one time they were in there for like such a long time and it, it, we weren't like hearing anything, but it you know, maybe they went over like an hour and we were like, All right, maybe we should like knock or whatever. And like I remember opening the door and it was just like I think it was just Noah Dave and Brian, and they were just all sitting like cross-legged around some synth that, that was just like, <laughs> just like droning some high-pitched thing. I, I swear they had been doing that for like an hour. I think they were like dialing in some sound or something. But uh, they were all just like kind of like sitting there staring at this like this tone that was just like, and I was like, and I just kind of opened the door and I just like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just so uh, interrupt the ritual. They, yeah, they're in, uh, they're yeah. They were just like at the altar of this weird synth noise. I love it. Yeah. And that, you know, again, like I, I, uh, or none of us were thinking about music in those types of ways at that time, you know? So those guys were really important to like open that portal for us of just like, you know, we, we, we didn't sit around and think about like frequencies and stuff, you know? And, uh, because of those guys, we started to do do that, you know, pay more attention to sound in general and, um, you know, just the way it works. Before we were just kind of like going for it and whatever happened, happened. And we weren't like thinking too deeply about these more detailed uh, aspects of sound, you know. Mm. So that was like, you know, like, yeah. I guess those guys like around uh, Dance Manatee or something where it was like very much about like frequencies you know yeah. like that would form like the basis of whole song for them or whatever but 
that was really interesting to be around. Yeah. It is sort of like, yeah, it's it's cool. I mean, just I'm thinking of this because you were mentioning like the 80s no wave stuff. Yeah. It's sort of like you guys kind of went there and like not rediscovered, but like discovered, like kind of got back to these like fundamental ideas, sort of like yourselves, like in your own kind of on your own path, I guess. Yeah. Starting from these sort of like bare bones principles of experimentation and then like moving moving towards like more structured stuff. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we never, we never wrote really wrote music until 2005 ish. Like uh, when our record God's money, when we recorded that, that's when we started kind of composing music, you know, before that we would just mm-hmm. have our shows consisted of like movements of whatever, like three or four movements that would just be like, mm-hmm. we would know which instruments we were going to play and what like the general mood was and that would be like it that would just be the skeleton of the whole show you know so it was like yeah. almost all improvised yeah and then uh we had a bandmate named Nathan who who was struck by lightning and uh he died on the rooftop and after that happened um something kind of unconscious happened where we just started like fo- hyper focusing on the band and that's when we started writing songs, you know? Wow. I'm uh, sorry to hear that. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, it's, it's holy shit. It's as beautiful as it is tragic, actually. It, it was kind of incredible that he achieved, yeah. achieved that. If you knew him, it would, it, it, you would understand exactly why, but he was a, a very, la- he was a mystic, like a real mystic, you know, like, and uh, spent much of his life, in pursuit of that kind of epic interaction wow. with whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. And you and you 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 see that event is pretty clearly tied to your the movement of the band sort of Yeah, I remember like we always talk about it, but none of us can none of us recall it as like a conscious decision or anything like mm. just when he passed, all of a sudden I guess that was our way of coping with it or something. We just got closer together. And spent more time in the practice space. And then we started kind of like writing these songs and instead of just spazzing out and improvising, you know, and that became God's Money, the record. And that's Nathan uh, on the cover is Nathan. The, like the eyes. Uh, yeah. Which still it does feel like a pretty loose record. I mean, compared it to is, yeah, but, and, I mean, you, it. Yeah. I mean, if you heard it before that, it, there was nothing. <laughs> there was no like semblance of a song or anything it was, i mean whatever there would be little melodies and stuff but but yeah and so from there that was sort of like this other starting point of the band or something from there that's when people started like asking us to travel and tour and play shows all over the world and stuff so it all kind of like started with nathan as the seed of that that part of the trajectory or whatever Brian. Uh, you can listen to part two over on our Patreon page. That's patreon.com slash bonefishpod. We talk more about his visual art collaborations with Animal Collective. Uh, he, he also clued us into a Animal Collective tour documentary he started making but has yet to finish. It's from their tour in Japan during the Meriwether era, like 2009, 2010. It sounds really cool. Hopefully that can be unearthed one day. Also on our Patreon, you can listen to our recent deep dive episodes on Strawberry Jam and Meriwether Post Pavilion. Patreon's not the only way to support us, though. You can always rate and review if you're enjoying the show. Or simply tell a friend who you think might enjoy it. We're also on Instagram, of course, at Bonefish Pod. And that's all we got. Thanks again to Brian DeGraw for talking with us. And until next time.
Bonefish. 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 Bonef